let's dive into the album, The Grayest of Blue Skies. So this comes out in 2000. This is your major label debut. Uh, yeah. What what um, emotions, thoughts, memories come back to you when you think of that album that really started this epic journey for you? Um, well, I, the big thing is working with Arnold Lanny. Um, we went into his studio pretty immediately after we got off the road. I remember we had a rehearsal place in Hamilton and we had started writing and it was, I do remember it was just stale. This uh, not a lot was coming down, coming out. It was a really shitty um, rehearsal room upstairs in downtown Hamilton. It just, the whole vibe really sucked. And I think Arnold had a free studio and, you know, he just finished an Our Lady Peace record, which was, uh, clumsy this was the the no, diamond you no know, it was, was after uh, that? it was the next one um with uh, in repair on it what's that record you know about the the machines uh spiritual machines yeah it was that one so he had just finished that record and the studio was open so instead of writing in hamilton at this room we sort of moved into his studio in toronto very quickly without songs without any songs written and we stayed there for six months and we sort of wrote and recorded as we went. And at that time, uh, wind up the record company had a scream three was coming out the movie and they had for some reason got the rights to like all the music on scream three. So I think all the bands on that soundtrack were wind up record bands. So we had an, a chance to be on that soundtrack. So the first thing we did there was record the song suffocate which I, get, I think we wrote at the studio too. So we recorded a mixed mastered and sent that out before we had any other song done. So it was sort of like that was, you know, we already kind of knew what we were going to get, the sound of this big Arnold Lanny sounding record. And then we had to go back and, and finish the, you know, the whole record. But yeah, a lot of the songs were just built from the ground up. I, we, I remember writing drag you down and it was Arnold sitting in a room and really constructing that song. I, I would, I would dare to say writing that song, you know, and we were just, you know, the vessel from him throwing ideas. Uh, and it was like that uh, with a lot of songs on Grace the Blue Skies. Arnold was a, you know, a massive piece of the writing or, and the sound of that record. Another thing that probably a not, not a lot of people know is <clears throat> most of the drums on that record are V drums. That was when Roland V drums first came out and it was this new, you know, these new pads were the new amazing thing. And Arnold had just got them. And sorry, sorry V drums are what an electronic drum kit or electronic drum set. Yeah. Um, so I think we set my drums up and then we had a V drum kit beside it. And when we were working on songs for it to be quieter, I just would play these V drums, the headphones on, but they were getting these huge sounds in the control room from these drums. So it, I kind of, I, it bummed me out at the time that, and I real, honestly, I think Arnold, you know, I was so young and we were trying to get this record done, especially the drums, which are done first. I'm not sure if Arnold had complete faith in how long it would take me to do it with V drums. You could just record and edit it. So we recorded the drum parts. Then I believe we did the cymbals after recorded them, which I know three days grace did on their first record too. just, you know, takes out any bleed in the drums. And then we started adding acoustic drums, more as ambient stuff. So in broken words, one of the songs on there, we had a huge bass drum, like a 28 inch bass drum. And I made a mallet out of a sock taped up with a drumstick, and we just, you know, we're hitting the bass drum and we had it super compressed. So, you know, in the control room, it was like, boom, this massive, almost an 808 sound. And so the, a lot of the bulk of the drums were electronic drums. I was playing them, but those sounds were coming from triggers <clears throat> and all the uh, un stuff underneath, you know, were real drums. Like in Drag You Down at the start, there's two drum tracks going. One's a real track, one's the V drums. And then sometimes in the song, we'd have a real floor tom with the drums. Every song was different because we were, like I said, we were writing them as we were recording them. So we didn't go in with a bunch of songs and start. We would do this song, work on the drums, write this song, work on the drums. So at the time when the album was done, <clears throat> I think I was a little, um, what's the word? Like I wasn't proud of the fact that it was, that most of it was electronic drums, even though I played it. 
And I remember a specific memory of this feeling is right after we had done finished the record, we went on tour with Creed, or I think we just played a show with Creed. And we were in the back of the bus with Scott Phillips, the drummer. And I think I came in after when they'd already listened to a few songs and he was with Rick. And I guess Rick had mentioned how we recorded it. And I know Scott didn't mean anything by this, but it just crushed me that I sat in the back lounge and he, went, he looked at me, he was like, you recorded with V drums on this. And just the way he said it, you know, just took the air out of me. And I was like, Oh my God, why, why is that bad? Or, and I just questioned everything. But now in hindsight, that record still to this day, it sounds so fucking great. Um, the guitar tones are, are amazing on it too, but the sound of those drums are, make a big part of that record. But um, what you're hearing are triggered sounds. So I'm not sure if you knew that or not, but that's one of the secrets to that record. Yeah, I didn't know that the drums sound sound great. So you would yeah. you'd never know. Yeah, well, spe- I mean, these days drummers are <laughs> hardly are in studios anymore. It's you can program drum parts now that are so real and so you know so cool. And a lot of rock bands, I don't think, would want to tell you do that. But I know tons of bands right now that the drummer's not even doing anything in the studio anymore because it's you can do it all it's sometimes a lot better than a human could. So, which kind of sucks to be the drummer, but um, you know, it's not always the case, but it's certainly a lot of the time. So we were sort of the pioneers in doing that, I guess. <laughs> uh, a lot of drummers are equal parts drummer, equal parts programmer, right? They get good at, at the days, programming. Sure. So at least they still have some control of their drums. So yeah. uh, on that album, Drag You Down, First Time, Bones and Joints, those were the big singles. Uh, in, in Canada, they did very well. What was it like hearing your songs on the radio for the first time? So yes, you were a part of the promotion of Tip that had, you mm-hmm. know, um, Awaken Dreaming and Tip and Above, and there were singles on that, but technically sure. you didn't play on those albums. So what was it yeah. like hearing these three singles on the radio, knowing that that is you? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because as we were re- releasing songs from Tip, other drummers would talk to me and they'd find out it was another drummer. So them not knowing the backstory <clears throat> that it came out before me, that Rob was in the band and had left the band. And you know the whole story of how I came to be there because when we re-released, re-released Tip, I was in the CD, the picture. So then it said in the sleeve, drums by Rob Gummerman. So it's, it looked like I was replaced in the studio. So after dealing with that for like two years of touring and to finally know I'm part of this record, you know, for real, that, you know, to me was a big thing as a drummer. But I think the first time I heard Drag You Down was at the, um, maybe the Bovine Sex Club in Toronto. I went there with some friends from Cambridge, I might've had it and asked the guy to play it. And um, that first um, guitar squeal that comes in, I don't know if it's a Wawa or what that is. I remember that in a club and just, it's like the whole place was, you know, th- there was this reaction. And um, another first memory I have is playing first time for Morgan, uh, Morgan from Seven Dust, the drummer, Morgan Rose. And <clears throat> I remember us all sitting in a little room I think it was that same show I was talking about that we played with Creed. Um, it was us, Seven Dust and Creed. And I remember Morgan reacting to first time and then calling the other guys in the band from Seven Dust in and listening to it. And just, I could see that they were listening to the production and you could see their eyes, you know, widen. Like uh, I knew we had done something cool. Um, as time went on, I, I'm not, I think some of the other guys in the band at some point in our career were just didn't like that record for whatever reason. But I always was very, very proud of that one. Probably to me, it stands out of all our records as sort of the, the you know, the pinnacle finger Eleven record to me. So that album comes out in 2000. I'm 15 years old. The drag you down music video comes out. Mm. I, I, I love the song. I love the image of the band. And I'm going to share something with you now sure. that you will either find endearing or, or you will be traumatized. So I'm going to okay. share my screen. Okay. I've never done this before. So hopefully this works. Let me know if you can see this. Oh, so, yeah. so this is me at 15 on the left and <laughs> I copied, and this is you on the right around the time of the drag you down m- music video. So yep. I, I, 
I thought your hair was the coolest thing that ever happened in rock and roll. So I bleached and spiked my hair like yours mm -hmm. and it ended up getting longer so I could have it, you know, coming down like yours. Mm -hmm. Look at, look at the necklace. Look at the facial hair. Amazing. So Amazing. when I show you this, part of me is proud. Part of me is embarrassed. And I feel right. like, like Stan in the Eminem song, right? <laughs> Where it's like the obsessed fan. And then right. what makes this even worse is if you look at us right now, we both have black shirts and black tubes. <laughs> but a beer, yeah, mine a little more gray, but yeah. And this this was not planned. So anyways, yes. I'll stop sharing my screen. But for those that are just That's listening awesome. to us, I shared a picture of him as an inspiration for what to me a rock star should look like. So oh, wow, uh, that is that's not weird or creepy at all. That's fucking amazing, man. And it's funny I'm holding the Naughty Boy Dread Wax. Um, yeah, that I just started growing dreads um, while we were recording Grace the Blue Skies. I think it was the House of Lords in Toronto. I went and got, you know, it was super painful. They were it was the beginning of, of dreadlocks. Um, so that's what that was. And I, I don't know. I think that's super cool, man. I love the little, the facial hair and everything too. We yeah, both I'm, look, I know you look very young in that, but I also look very young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed and slightly proud oh, by that, dude, but it's, uh, no way. it's cool. Anyways. So grace of blue skies, this was your first gold record in Canada. This is your first, mm -hmm. your first Juno nomination. This is for rock. I think a rock album of the year. What did those two things mean to you? The gold record, um, getting the gold record, which in Canada are <laughs> kind of small, you know, you always picture like the gold record, a big thing on your wall. Um, but just to get that thing to put on my wall and I got one made for my, I think my mom and dad and my brother and sister, so I got like four other ones that meant something as a symbol that, you know, that I had, I guess, gotten to a certain level and achieved something, uh, even though, you know, 50,000 records is not a lot of records. It, it just symbolized, um, I guess that I had made it. Uh, and I remember we got, um, they presented us those awards at Edgefest in Molson park. I remember. So that was the first anything I, we'd ever, I think we got a scream three gold record first before we got that one. So I had, we all had one of those on our wall, but to get a finger 11 one was massive. And I still have that downstairs in my house right now. So I believe that the grayest of blue skies is the darkest um, and heaviest finger 11 album. Uh, sure. Do you, do you agree with that? And why sure. do you, why do you think that is? I, I, on a side note, um, Rick mentioned that that was probably the hardest album to make. So just mm. putting that out there. Right. Um, well, I think at the time, you know, age has a lot to do with it. We were younger. Um, I think a big part of what made that heavy was Scott. Um, even if you look at the way he looked back at then, there was, we just had a different angst because we were younger. Um, I'm sure the bands we were listening to at that time, I know me and Rick definitely were loving corn back then. Um, yeah, I think it just was our age and what was coming out from our experience, you know, touring the first record. And it was just what came out naturally. Um, the subject matter in the studio with Scott, again, there was so much of that record was done. It's like Arnold Lanny was really a band member on that. So everything you're hearing on that was as much Arnold in some cases more than any of us, but you know, they spent so much time recording guitars. I mean, we were there for six months and a lot of that was guitar and experimenting. And there's so many different sounds and, and things back then. So I could see Rick saying it was the hardest record to make. Um, but we were young and we, you know, and we were, I don't know if we were angry. We just had angst, which I think is a different thing. We were eager and angst. And uh, I don't think we ever set out to make a heavy record. That was just what came out at the time. So, yeah, I don't know what it was, man. But as the years went on, definitely the band's um, influences changed. I, Scott was never really a heavy dude. He, you know, he was always a singer songwriter guy. So. I don't know if looking back, if that would be his favorite record. I think, you know, he preferred singing over screaming, which I'm sure most singers do, but um, some of the stuff on that record to sing was really 
difficult, especially as years went on, on his, on his voice. So unfortunately there were songs that we wanted to play later um, that when we were doing headline shows, we're, we're just, you know, to play every night, we're damaging for him. So, you know, I know drag you down for a while. We, we weren't playing it just cause it was like the potential of him blowing his vo voice up. So it was like a 22 year old singer versus a 32 year old singer singing drag you down. It's, it's harder on his body and voice. So yeah, youth, man, youth and angst, I'd say is the answer. So I infiltrated the world of, of world-class drummers for this interview. Okay. So I okay. have a quote from one of my all-time favorite bands. So this is from Chad Selica from Breaking Benjamin and yeah, Black okay. Label Society. So I probably butchered his last name. I apologize. So this is what Chad says. I love that man. Well, what can I say about Rich? He's a great musician, drummer, and now a great father. What he brings to drums is showmanship, the creativity, pocket and groove. I've had the pleasure to do shows with him, actually festivals. Watching him play is unbelievable with the passion he brings and the talent he possesses. I'm also a huge fan of his drumming and his bands, not to mention he is a great human, heart emoji. I got to add that. I love that guy. So that's from Chad from Breaking Benjamin. Wow. Yeah, every time you're doing this, I get like, ah, I get teary, man. I love that guy as well. And he is one of the best drummers I've ever toured with um, by far. And that guy practiced all day at festivals, always was practicing. He's such a man. He's a remarkable player <clears throat> and he's an amazing guy, too. And it's really beautiful to hear him say that stuff. I mean, I don't know. I, my heart is blown wide open when I hear that in all the best ways, man. That's really great. But great guy. I, you know, Bre Breaking Benjamin, uh, Sean, their drummer now is such an awesome guy, such a great drummer. Two different guys, two different eras of the band, um, both amazing. And uh, that's that's beautiful, man. I love Chad. He, man, he's a powerhouse drummer as well. I, you know, I've it's seen time. those guys live so many times and, and he, he is very visual too. He does some real cool. That's stuff. what I was going to say that he he's like you where, you know, it's, it's like a car crash. You can never look away. Like once you spot you or him on the drum kit, it's like you forget about everything else and you're just zoned in on, on those guys. 